My background is a bit mixed. I'm an ecological artist or a bio-artist participating as a primary research biologist. For the past decade, my primary research has been investigating the occurrence of deformities in amphibian populations, primarily in North America, but also in other parts of the world, and looking at um, uh, declining populations of amphibians. About a third of amphibians in our lifetime particularly those of us that are under the age of 75 or even 50, have started to decline or have already disappeared. So this is something that's happening very, very rapidly. And it's something that, um, as an artist or a biologist, it's of real interest because it's changing really, really fast. As far as looking at deformities here in the UK, it was just more or less a hunch. I read about scattered reports historically of deformed amphibians coming from France, also from Germany and particularly Eastern Europe, but nothing had really been described here, at least nothing over the past century or century and a half. And in North America, they've been reported in 48 out of 50 states. Uh, it seems to be an increasing phenomenon. Uh, they've also been found in Australia, Asia, Latin America, so I think it is really an international phenomenon, but it's something that hasn't really been well studied by working with Arts Catalyst, contacting researchers that were doing amphibian surveys in Yorkshire. On the second day, I had come over and went to one of the sites and started finding things immediately. And this was a site that's been studied for 10 years. It's at least been looked at. Um, but no one had described what we were finding yet. No one had seen deformed amphibians there before. And then just kind of stopping and looking and being there at the right time, we ended up finding several that day, went back to the site, found more, and have continued to find more and more at the site each time we go. And now we've got a little garden pond and an estate in northern Yorkshire that seems to have an increasing number of little tiny toads that are missing parts. In North America, Often uh, the deformities we have are supernumeric limb growth. So far what I'm finding here in the UK is a reduction. It's uh, ectromelia, which is where there are missing parts. So it's really early into the investigation to try to come up with why that's happening. Right now we're just trying to get an idea of what percentage that appears to be happening in. Uh, when you're doing surveys like this, what you do is instead of going out and looking for adult amphibians or breeding pairs of amphibians, uh, you need to look at the little metamorphs, which are the kind of tiny little tadpoles that have just started to form their legs and their front arms and are trying to make it out into the terrestrial environment. These are really key because from that, it tells you what kind of developmental abnormalities are apparent in a population. Last year was a really hard summer to survey because of the rains. So we didn't get a clear window of when the metamorphs were kind of all popping out. Instead, they were just popping out all summer. So every time we went to the site, there were just thousands of toads everywhere. So it's really hard to say if that was a normal year. One of the first things that I'd like to do is try to look at natural phenomenon into why these deformities could be occurring. Natural phenomenon would include something genetic though there's probably not a very good likelihood of something like that, but that's something we can easily test. The second thing would be things like predation. Another thing might be parasites. Well, it's a little different than the way most biologists would typically, field ecologists or biologists would typically approach their research. Instead of going out and just doing the surveys on my own or with a group of kind of colleagues, um, what I try to do is bring the public along. So there's a real performative side, but also a kind of participatory side where I'm trying to get the public interested and trying to get them engaged and actually participating in science. And then it becomes some kind of hybrid, I think. It's no longer just kind of classic field biology, but you're actually getting people and in a way shaping them or kind of at least pulling them in a certain direction to get them to really start to look.
for me, one of the first times that I found a deformed amphibian, it was kind of a really almost uncanny psychological response. I mean, it was, you go to a wetland and it's beautiful and you pull up a frog with 20 back legs and you don't really feel like this is a normal thing, that this is a normal part of daily life. And it really kind of hits in a way about the kind of fragility of the environment and the fragility of species that we share the planet with. But it's a real way of feeling out what's happening. Um, so as far as the, the kind of, that's the same experience that I try to bring along to people. Even if we don't find any deformities, that's great. I prefer we don't. I like when we go out and we find lots of fat, happy toads and frogs hopping around and eating and mating and, and having a great life. Because um, that's still a great experience for people to be able to do. But when we do find something, it's usually, I think there's a, there's a real way to kind of get people concerned and interested and hopefully invested in wanting to do more and more. Once they've been preserved, I do something called clearing and staining. And this is a technique that was developed to study embryonic development. So you can understand where the energy of the developing organism goes. What I typically do is a two-color technique where you use a kind of blue dye, a blue stain to look at cartilage, and a red stain to look at calcified tissue. And what this tells you is if there's something like a frog with no back legs or with 20 back legs, how the kind of what stage of development that deformity occurs at. We start to pull them in and tell them a story. I mean, it is, the work is scary, um, but what we're doing to the environment is scary, and we have to bring this, I think, to the public to let people know what we're doing. Um, and doing the clearing and staining and scanning is a, and then printing is a really good way um, to do the science side of things, but also to convey an environmental message to people through the artwork. And it's also a way to get them to interface uh, with an environment in a way that they wouldn't normally probably interface by catching tadpoles and taking the time to really look at them and hold them and kind of engage with a different life form. Uh, and then when they find something, it's usually quite dramatic. Since 2007, there have been some fascinating discoveries. We found uh, populations of toads and some frogs in Middle England with developmental deformities, uh, missing limb deformities, and trying to get at what could be some of the proximate causes for those. Uh, following in the summer of 2008, the field research continued, but uh, a larger scale temporary laboratory was built at Yorkshire Sculpture Park, a public bioart laboratory in which members of the public were invited to participate on the environmental field trips or the eco-actions, um, and they were also invited to come in to look at carefully controlled experimental simulations. And sure enough, what we found is um, several different predators uh, that could injure tadpoles, and the remarkable thing is actually how uh, these tadpoles survive very, very severe injuries. Little dragonfly nymphs, Sympetrum species, they, they would capture the young toad tadpoles, grab them, and in some cases actually move them around with their mandibles till they got to this great part that they wanted. They often ate the limbs, the tiny little developing legs, and they would eat just a portion, and then we don't know why yet, uh, throw them back. And it just shows the resilience of life, the resilience of these amphibians, the way that they're able to sustain these incredible injuries. What we did is we, we solved a big piece of the puzzle, but it's an awfully big puzzle. We don't know what's going on in ecosystems around the world. We can make assumptions and build and gather more and more data and do more and more experimental simulations, but we still have a long way to go. It's a great example of uh, basically an art science project that has had an impact. Uh, even if it's in a small community, amphibians are awfully important, and the more we know about them, the more we can learn how to try to help provide uh, natural resources for them, sustain their populations, and keep space for them. And I think that's a worthwhile thing to do.